What if you're a skeptic? Lots of skeptics. Lots of skeptics out there. Professional skeptics, in fact. Okay, so first of all, there's nothing wrong with saying you're a skeptic if by skeptic you mean I require good, compelling evidence in order to come to a conclusion. If that's what skepticism means, we should all be skeptics. We should never cease being a skeptic in the sense that we need to have good reasons to believe. And we want good evidence. We don't want to just be making it up just according to our fancy or our will or what somebody told us. So in that sense, we should all be skeptics. But that's not really what skepticism means, at least in contemporary uses of it. Um, skepticism oftentimes means a form of what, what I'm calling here absolute skepticism. And what is absolute skepticism? It's the claim that I'm skeptical about everything. Absolutely everything. Everything you say, huh? I'm skeptical about it. I don't know. I don't know. You could be wrong. Could be wrong. Could be wrong. Could be wrong. Probably wrong. Could be wrong. Right? So skepticism is like this, this universal disposition to question everything and in that questioning to be committed to never come to a conclusion about everything. That's the kind of skepticism we see, especially among teenagers. The problem with the teenagers now have become like the, the, the dominant mode of being now is being a teenager for life. Like questioning everything. Okay, well, let's play that game. Let's play the question everything game. Is that coherent? Can you actually do that? And the answer is no, you can't. Why? Three laws of logic strike again. In order to be a skeptic, I have to know what it means to be a skeptic. In other words, I have to define the term skepticism, I have to define the term me, and I have to define the relationship between a me and a skeptic and say this is what the relationship is between the two. In other words, I can't be skeptical about the definition of what being skeptical is. I must have a definition, law of identity, right? I also can't claim to myself that I can both be skeptical and not skeptical in the same time in the same way, or else I'm saying something nonsensical. So I'm not skeptical about the impossibility of both being skeptical and not skeptical in the same time the same way. Law of non-contradiction. And I also recognize that I'm either going to be skeptical about something or not being skeptical about something. Law of excluded middle. But it even gets more absurd than that. If you're really going to be a skeptic about everything, you're going to commit yourself to this kind of position. I'm skeptical about my skepticism. Ah, but I must be skeptical about my skepticism of my skepticism. Well, that's not going to be enough, right? I have to be skeptical of my skepticism, of my skepticism, of my skepticism. But I am a diehard skeptic, so therefore I must what? Be skeptical of my skepticism, my skepticism, my skepticism, my skepticism. If we're going to play this game, let's play it. Let's do it, folks. We're going to go all the way down. And that means that our minds literally cannot grab onto a thought for more than a nanosecond before it has to jump off and say, uh-uh, I question you, question you, I, what's an I, question, question, what's a question, language, what, what's coming out of my mouth, right? You dissolve into a heap of nonsensical sound and movement if you're really going to play the skeptical game all the way down. So skepticism is more about an attitude than actually a philosophically coherent position, right? Again, it's okay, it's good to be a skeptic and asking for evidence, but no one, literally no one, can be an absolute skeptic. So skepticism is something that we cannot take as a serious challenge to religion or to Christianity if we're talking about absolute skepticism, because absolute skepticism is internally incoherent. It dissolves, it collapses under its own weight. Okay, this is the one I would be waiting for. Is truth judgmental? No, it's not. So, this is the formulation we usually get, right? Who are you to judge? Who are you to judge? Now, that's typically tied to, and, uh, and this is great because it's people who know this line of the Bible, but no, <laughs> no other line of the Bible. Uh, this is the only line they've ever memorized, is this one right here. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. And it's even better in the King James Version. Do not judge so that ye not be judged. And it sounds more authoritative, right, with the ye. Okay, so how do we unpack this? Well, first of all, we have to recognize that um, read the passage itself. That's a good place to start when you're quoting Jesus is read the whole book. So this is, first and foremost, this is not a warning against judgment per se. It's a warning against hypocrisy. Meaning the standard of judgment Jesus is recognizing as a, as a legitimate standard. How could he not if he's told us the way is narrow, the path is narrow, and the gate 
the path is narrow and the gate is narrow and few will enter. That means that we're going to have to make some distinctions in life between the wide and the, and, and the narrow, right? So there's numerous biblical passages suggesting that we need to use our judgment. This particular one is about don't be a hypocrite. Don't focus on other people's errors, even minor errors, when you are a full-blown whatever, right? That you are just basking in sin and you're focused on another person who is uh, singing too loud at church or something like that. So focus on yourself first. That's the, that's the clear and evident meaning of that passage. We shouldn't say we can't dig deeper into it, but that seems to be the obvious reading. But there's a conceptual and um, philosophical point here as well. To say that we should not judge is to make a judgment. It's to come to a conclusion about what is right in the face of a potential opposite conclusion, which is that we should judge. So we have two claims, you should judge, you should not judge. And then we're forced with the, the task of saying, which one is the right one? And I say, oh, you shouldn't judge. What have I just done? Made a judgment. In other words, in order not to judge, we have to judge. We have to make a demarcation about what we think is true and right and good and, and to identify it and then to live according to that standard. So what this is a warning against, and this is a serious warning, is we shouldn't be judgmental. Being judgmental means feeling yourself morally superior or better than other people because of something that you possess or uh, acquiring, giving yourself the role of God and condemning other people to perdition when you are alone are the righteous one. Jesus warns about that time and time again. That is prohibited. Making judgments, on the other hand, is not only permitted, it's commanded. We have to make judgments. So the point is, is no. Making truth claims is not being judgmental. It's impossible not to make judgments when you are making truth claims. So my great appeal is if we could please stop saying that. All right. In conclusion... We cannot avoid the conclusion that there is a universal truth about God and the purpose of life. There is a truth. We can't not think that there is a truth. So the question, therefore, now shifts from whether there is a truth to what is the truth. But that first part we have to recognize that we, we have a clear answer to that. Whether there is a truth, yes, 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 there is a truth. What is the truth? That gets a lot more complicated. It's a lot more complicated, and we certainly can't take a, a facile attitude toward it and say, well, that's going to be easy to answer. It's not. But it is pretty easy to answer whether. And we can't forget that as, that as the foundation that we can now stand upon as we seek greater and greater clarity. So that's the question we're going to be looking at in subsequent lectures. It's also, from a theological perspective, it gives us insight into God's claims of who he is, of who God is. So God reveals himself, even though it appears early in the Old Testament, but God reveals himself in Exodus as Yahweh, which translated what? My name is I am. My name is I exist. And then Jesus comes along and says, my name is the truth. So, We've got a foundation here, but that foundation is already pointing beyond itself to another conclusion to which we will be working as we go through these lectures. So thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your questions. I, I think what I'm seeing is there's a process here as we're going to get to where we're going to start talking about um, Catholic faith? Is that what we're doing here? Yes. Uh, we, well, uh, let me give you two answers. So the question is, is, is there a process of, of when we're eventually going to be talking about Catholic? So uh, Catholic itself, the word means universal, right? And embedded in that, in that word, embedded in that concept, is, is we can also read it through a Trinitarian lens. And what I mean by that is that if God is one, then God is, then the truth is one, right? And insofar as we can locate 
God incarnate, not only as the Christ, we can, but also as the Logos. Think of the very beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, insofar as we're speaking about anything that's true in existence, we're already speaking about God. And if we're already speaking about God, we're already speaking about the Catholic faith. So, that's one of the beauties of Catholicism, is that Catholicism does not one of the ways that, that, that I like to put it is Catholicism loves the full Trinitarian God. Um, so we don't just look at God incarnate in, in the Jesus Christ. Of course we do, and that's the culmination of, of history and the culmination of our lives. And, not but, and we look at God as creator, who has created the universe in a particular kind of way and imbued creation with order and meaning and purpose that we can access with our minds in the form of identifying the Logos. Jesus Christ has always been there in the form of the Son, always there. And so, insofar as we are talking about the truth, if it really is the truth, we're talking about Christ. And insofar right. as, as we are living that truth, and that truth is becoming more and more apparent to us in and through the action of the Spirit, we're talking about the Spirit as well. So we already are, this is a, a longer way of saying, yes, we already are talking about the Catholic faith. Right. We're just using a more basic vocabulary for doing it. You mentioned something about the nuns, those that are, uh, don't have a, any affiliation with any church for the most part, and yet they can have, um, uh, many people will still be like meditating, they believe in doing that, so there is a spiritual sense because for us there is a spirit and so as the saying goes you know you go with the spirit so how is that going to tie in to how we see the spirit for us it's the holy spirit and yet we have our own spirit that comes with what? Personality and all that. So those differences in, in, in trying to converse with, with somebody that is in the nuns is the challenge. And where do we find a common starting point? Uh, it's a great question. So um, I think there's, there's, there's various approaches to take. And um, in, in the spirit of the virtue of prudence, uh, it's a question of, well, what's the best approach with, with each individual person in terms of where they are in their own spiritual development, where they are in terms of their own willingness. Willingness is ultimately, I think, the biggest, the, the biggest factor that, that anybody's ever up against um, because there's a lot of people who just don't want to hear arguments. Uh, there's a lot of people who will even agree with you if you lead them through an argument and then say, but I still don't, I still don't want it. So, so that's a different nut to crack when it's will. I think one thing to keep in mind is, is it, it's helpful to use, to use the Socratic method. And, and we were just talking about before, um, you know, well, what makes something Catholic? Uh, well, Socrates obviously existed in terms of a, a historical chronology before, uh, before Jesus Christ did. But the, one of the reasons that the Catholic Church has always been at home using philosophy it goes back to a theological reason, which is that if God is one, then the truth is one, and any speaking about the truth is in fact the truth, and you're speaking about God. So anything that we can find in philosophy that's true, the Catholic Church can point to it and say that's true, and that's of the nature of Christ. So why, why did I bring up Socrates? Socrates was a, um, a brilliant questioner. And something that he, he did, and it, it drove people mad, um, but it still sort of set philosophy on, on the path of its development in, in terms of the, the refinement of, of understanding different possible conceptions of the truth, is he would just ask for clarifications and definitions. So, for example, we meet lots of people who will say things like, um, I don't believe in God, but I believe in reincarnation. And they'll say that as a, as a, as a statement of fact to you. Now, part of us could be compelled just to say, well, interesting, that's, 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 um, that's one way to be an atheist, I suppose. But then we could say, um, but does it actually make sense? And so gently ask them, 
For example, if it's true that there is no God, and it's also true that there is some power that's capable of somehow identifying a disembodied soul and moving it from one material creature to another material creature, then how is that possible if, if there isn't an immaterial power that is sort of acting in such a way so that one soul can be transformed into another material creature? In other words, wouldn't you need a god of some sort to have reincarnation? So my, my advice is this. Don't be afraid to point out, as, as we should not be afraid to be on the receiving end either, inconsistencies. There are massive, massive, massive inconsistencies that, that are just this toxic stew in our culture right now. For example, I only believe in science. Okay. And... Uh, Human beings have um, equal dignity, and therefore you should vote for this particular law. Okay. How do you get from a standpoint where you're saying you only believe in observable phenomena? That's what, we'll talk more about this in a future lecture, but say, I only believe in things that I can experience through my senses, and I believe that human beings are all morally equal. In order for those two statements to coexist, it would have to be true that we can observe human, human moral equality with our senses. Tell me how we do that. Tell me where that exists. Tell me the experiment by which you are able to demonstrate in a non-falsifiable way that human beings have equal dignity. Where is the little dignity core in every single human being that has just been discovered on an MRI recently or something like that? It's nonsensical. It doesn't make sense. So again, as we're talking to the nuns, a lot of prudence is required, right? Because you, you don't want to come on too strong, you don't want to appear like you're a jerk, and you don't want to make somebody feel like they're stupid. And of course, we always make arguments that sometimes have holes in them. We make arguments that have holes in them sometimes too. So it's, it's a two-way street, but if people are speaking nonsense, we've got to say it's nonsense. I don't believe in God, but yeah, I'm going to heaven. No, I hear these things. I'm not making this up. Right? Or, I don't believe in God, but, um, but this is unjust. That's a very common one. I don't believe there's a universal system of justice. I don't believe in universal truths. But that's wrong. Again, call out the inconsistencies. If we don't start doing that, then these, nonsense, these positions of nonsense are just going to continue to lead to confusion. And moral confusion always leads to always leads to some form of destruction or another. We have to keep, we have to keep that in mind as well. There's, uh, uh, you mentioned the uh, relativism. Uh, you know, we have to be pretty well read in so many different uh, subjects like that or topics to know just what that is and to have a better, uh, for the, the, the lay people, because a lot of nuns, are, are those that made First Communion, grew up, and just kind of like hit the uh, high school or community college, and, and then they just went on and they were bombarded by all these well-read people, including probably a lot of scripture. And for us Catholics, we're, we didn't have that. We're just beginning to get so much more. Everything that you presented, um, I can swim okay, and I'm, a, a, you know, I'm not drowning in it. And there's so much to soak in. So, bringing it down to the level of someone that is uh, not, I guess, educated enough in the Catholic Church, but they could be with all the other uh, things that they, they uh, are told about or, or even professors that just say, don't worry about it, it's, it's, it's not real and in a roundabout way they'll, they'll say. So it can be a real challenge to know exactly where to get started. So relativism, how is that, at, is there various levels? Another great question. Uh, 
so the, the question is about how, how do we address the one the preponderance of, of relativism in the culture, its general acceptance, and uh, also the fact that many self-proclaimed relativists are, are very well read. Um, very well read doesn't necessarily mean very well reasoned, by the way. Uh, it just means that they, they can repeat a lot of different arguments. Mm -hmm. At the heart of relativism, however, is, um, is, is a very simple truth, and that's that if it's true, if relativism is true, that there are no universal truths, certainly no universal moral truths, then there's nothing else to say at that point. Your professorial career is over. All you can do in terms of bringing enlightenment of any kind would be to describe different kinds of beliefs that people have. And here's the reality about different kinds of beliefs that people have. There's as many beliefs as people. And so it doesn't really matter what category you use. Well, look at this culture, or look at this ethnic group, or uh, look at this historical time period, or look at this region, or whatever. You're making at that point, if it's all relative, you're making arbitrary groupings of people and saying, well, look at their values. And this is the trick that the relativists usually play, and this is why I said point out the nonsense and call it for what it is. They'll say, all values are relative. It's all based on people's experiences. There's no conclusion that we could reach. But here's an example of a group of people doing something that's really, really good, and you should be like them. And you know what? Then they even add a little cherry on top and say, you're not a part of that group. But I am. You know what that means? I get to tell you what to do. This is, this is, the, this is the fog that has set about our culture, and it's, sort of, it's caught so many people unawares because they think that their lives have meaning and purpose, at least they, they act as if they do, and then they're told that they don't have meaning and purpose, but then at the same time, then they're told that they do have meaning and purpose, but only if they follow this particular moral pattern that has been established by these so-called experts. This is a mess, right? This is an absolute mess. And it comes down to the old politician saying, what are you going to believe? Are you going to believe your lion eyes or are you going to believe me, right? Well, believe your lion eyes. And we have to go back to those fundamental, basic, logical truths that when somebody says to you, for example, all things are relative, and then tries to tell you how you should vote or live your life, what political party you should be of, or that you shouldn't be a part of that religion because that's a discrimination, you say, choose one. Choose one. Is it, I should do this because you think it's true, and you think it's true because it's actually true? Or is it, nothing's true? In which case, why are you wasting my time? Right? I'll get on with my day. Either or. We can't be afraid to call people out on this. And stop letting people, ab <laughs> sorry. Stop letting people abuse you with the claim of being an expert. The thing about theology is that and this is, this is encoded in our DNA, biologically, but also spiritually. We're all made in the image and likeness of God. That means we all have truth detectors inside of us. We're all masterful truth detectors. And the only reason that we get sort of disoriented is because we have systems of thought that come in and seek to tell us things that we, at first, will balk at because it doesn't seem to make sense. But if you have enough people telling you something, over time, and then they attach professional consequences to it, and then they attach social consequences to it, and then they attach uh, uh, monetary consequences to it, and then maybe you could even go to jail. Well, then you'll start thinking, okay, maybe what my eyes were telling me was wrong. The only way we're going to get out of this is if we revert back to those. And this is, this is what the original church did, right? This is what the martyrs did. This is what the, the, the church fathers did to speak the truth no matter what the consequences. There's no other path forward. We're not getting out of this any other way. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Actually, what, what I was going to say is not so much a question, but a comment, and that you know, you're talking about the truth and getting through. I'm, I'm anxious to get to the, the four points. I, I, have them written down right here somewhere, but getting to those four points because in, you know, in society today, there's so much pressure to be politically correct, culturally correct, you know, socially correct with the things that you can say. And I, I think the outline that you've created so far kind of 
gives me a little bit of hope and that there'll be confidence to be able to speak the truth of the Catholic faith to other people and you know to have the the knowledge the truth in that and not feel like we have to be guarded with our words because it is the truth and anyway I that just really that really stuck out with me in, in the truth and just having the confidence to share that, you know, when, when you're in the workplace and it doesn't mean, you know, putting other people down, but, you know, the questions like you're saying, if you see something that's not consistent, point it out, question it, and, and that continues the dialogue, so that's just something that I'm looking forward to as these lectures continue. If I may make a comment in response to your comment, um, I, I think, I think you, you, you said it quite well. Uh, it's also important to recognize that there will always be consequences to truth, always. And, um, and I also don't want to give the impression that truth is, is, is always simple and obvious. It, it's not. It's not. Um, and I think it's better to think of truth more as a, um, as a kind of, and this isn't my metaphor, but I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a powerful metaphor, is you think, uh, think of like a chain or a rope of many strands that are, that are tied together. So it's not just that we hold on to one argument or one strand. We want to bind that strand with as many strands as possible, make the rope as, as thick as possible. So that, that requires ongoing study, ongoing recognition of the, of the weaknesses in our, our own arguments, ongoing openness to criticism. We, can, we must always be open to criticism and the harshest forms of criticism. And one of the things that, that we also have to recognize along the way is we're going to pay a price for this. There's no, th this is built into the theology of the, of the cross as well. There's no shortcut. And that's why, that's why Jesus says to Peter, right after he said in Matthew that I'm going to found my church on you, I'm going to build my church on you, the rock, uh, get behind me, Satan. It's, well, wait a minute, I, th I thought you were the rock, right? Right after just get behind me, Satan. Why? Because Peter has suggested to Jesus that there's another way to attain salvation, taking a shortcut around the cross. That's the devil talking. So this idea that we can, that we can, accomplish real good in the world without sacrifice, genuine real sacrifice that actually hurts and is unfair and unjust and puts you in a position where you have to watch wicked people temporarily winning. That's the nature of the world that we've created. It's a, a sinful world and the path of salvation is not taking a shortcut around it or dangling above but walking right through it. And so there will be there are. There are costs. But we don't walk alone.